welcome to Widowcast Podcast, where you learn how to find the strength to get through your journey and the skills to coach other widows. This is not your average grief group. This is your journey group. It just may show you the way to make something amazing come out of the emotional pain and trauma of widowhood. I'm your host, Joanne Philomena. I'm the best-selling author of Widowed and Widow Coach, and I'm a professional certified life coach. Let the healing and your personal journey begin. You're listening to episode 67, Don't Believe Everything You Think. Truly don't. Back on episode 65, I talked to you about story versus fact, how to break what you're telling yourself down so that you can identify the exact facts, right? Facts are neutral. The facts don't have any adjectives, no judgment, no opinion, just straight facts. And that's the first step to using a thought model to coach yourself, to coach other widows. This is the basis of what I teach in the Widow Coach Certification class. Um, I teach 12 different tools, (laughs) and we will go through a lot of that. But really, I think this is one of the most powerful tools that I have ever learned. Um, I learned the basics of this way before I saw this formula written out, because this has been presented over and over again in history, all the way back to Marcus Aurelius, um, right? The, the idea of examining your own thoughts and that your thoughts create everything for yourself. Your thoughts drive your feelings, which drive your actions and creates the results in your life. That goes back to that kind of boiled down, hey, you create your own reality. I don't know if you've all ever heard that before. Um, It was repeated over and over again in the movie The Secret, which um, I believe the movie The Secret had a lot of fallacies in it, a lot of flaws uh, that were a little bit misleading. But... I want to help you understand that it's not the events in our lives that shape us. It's what we believe about those events. Okay. And let me see if I can make this clearer for you. Uh, Because I don't want you to immediately relate it all back to the loss of your spouse, which is our first thing that we want to do. But that makes it very hard to wrap our head around. And I, I will explain why as I get towards the the meat of this for you. But we are programmed with a lot of beliefs when we're growing up. As children, our brains are wide open sponges. Literally, the prefrontal cortex hasn't finished developing. And there's a reason that children's brains are wide open sponges. They learn at a rapid fire rate. The first year of life alone, think how much a baby learns from the time they're born until now they're walking, they're beginning to feed themselves, and they're beginning to use speech, right? Um, But during those years of childhood, not just the first year, but wow, right on up through high school even, Through those years when your brain is still wide open to knowledge, to learning, we're absorbing everything, including the beliefs of our parents, the beliefs of our teachers, the beliefs of those around us. Our prefrontal cortex isn't developed enough to make judgments about what other people believe. As children, we just take it at face value. Now, what is the problem with that? Like our parents loved us and gave us the best start they could, hopefully. But the fact is, your parents developed their beliefs when they were children and their brains were wide open and their brains were accepting the beliefs of everybody around them. Do you see the continuity there? A lot of the beliefs you may have formed through those childhood years are maybe not serving you today. 
They could be beliefs that if you took them out one by one, if you could reach into your brain and take out your beliefs one by one and lay them on the table and look at them, you might say, wow, I've really been believing that. That's not true. Okay? We, we go around with a lot of that programming inside of us. And that's what we use to judge the events of our lives. Now, when I go back to the thought coaching model, this is, and you're going to want to get a piece of paper out, and you're going to want to write this down if you've never seen this before. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a little froggy today. Write down one underneath the other, like in a column, the letter C, which is for circumstance, T, which is for thought, F, which is for feeling, A, which is for actions, and R, which is for result. I really want you to write that down, C-T-F-A-R, so that you have the visual in front of you. Because this is an amazing thing. The C is for the circumstance. Those are the bare facts. That's what I was discussing two episodes ago. How to look at what you're thinking about a situation and then identify what are just the facts of it. So I could be thinking a whole story about something that happened. I could be thinking how terrible it is and how awful that person was to me. But if I want to boil it down to the facts, the facts would be I have a friend. My friend said this in the exact words because that is without judgment. That's what you could prove in a court of law, right? The exact words your friend said to you. Then on the T line, this is for your thought. It's the sentence that plays in your brain in response to the facts. So if your friend said to you, I don't think you should attempt that. You won't be any good at it. And you thought, oh my God, she said that in front of everybody. And she doesn't think that I would be good at that. How dare she? How dare she talk down to me? right? Maybe the sentence that hurts the most is the, how could she talk down to me like that? The feeling on the F line is one word. And it's when you think that thought, how could she talk down to me like that? It's how that thought makes you feel because that's where our feelings come from. That's so important to understand. Your feelings don't come from the facts. Your feelings come from what you think about the facts. When you have a thought in your brain, a sentence plays in your brain, it vibrates down into your body. It actually creates little neuropeptides and chemical release that flow into your body and create the feeling, the emotion. We refer to emotions as feelings because we feel them in our body, right? And when you have a feeling, it affects how you act or react in the world. Everything we do in the world is based on either how we feel or how we want to feel. Um, sometimes... What we do in response to a feeling is to take no action at all because the feeling just shuts us down. That's the A line. That's the actions. Okay? So we have C for the circumstance. T is the sentence that plays in your brain, it's the thought. F is for feeling. It's how that thought makes you feel. And A is for action. It's how you act or don't act in response to your feeling. And then the R line is the result in your life that's created by the action you just took or the non-action you just took. It's a formula. And it's a formula that proves out over and over and over again if you do it right. Because the result that you create in your life will always prove 
your thought right. And our brain loves to be right. It reinforces the thought because the thought is what sets in motion that cascade of feelings and actions that create the results. So again, it is your interpretation of the circumstances in your life that create your thoughts and your feelings, how you act or don't act and the results that you create in your life. It all starts on that T line. Everything in your life starts with that thought. Now, here's the deal. When I teach this to my new coaches, and they immediately want to start fixing all of their thoughts, right? Like, oh, I'm having negative thoughts. I can't, let's get rid of that. But no, because we're not meant to have positive thoughts 100% of the time. We might as well be robots if that's what we were doing. And trust me, I've had students tell me that they have positive thoughts 100% of the time. <laughs> and I call BS on it every time. Because that's not part of the human experience. That's the android experience. That's the robot experience, okay? It is part of our humanity that we choose negative thoughts and feelings part of the time. And that's okay. There's very good reason to have negative thoughts and feelings. When we are confronted with something like horrendous child abuse, would we want to be happy, happy about that? I sure wouldn't. That's part of my compassion, part of my humanness, that I look at that and think, this is just awful. How can we make this stop in the world? And I feel deep sadness over it. I choose to feel deep sadness over child abuse. And that's just fine. How, does, how could a negative thought serve me? Sometimes it can. Maybe that deep sadness helps me take action. If nothing else, perhaps I make a donation to a fund for abused kids, right? So when I teach this, I'm not telling you to, feel, to not feel sad over the death of your spouse. Of course you choose to feel sad. You choose to grieve. And that's okay. That's okay. But you, what you want to do is examine all of your thoughts around it, especially after a period of time. Because if you are still feeling the deep, deep emotional pain and depression, well past the point that you want to continue feeling that, maybe you're at a point where you're thinking, this has just got to stop. I have to have more in my life than this pain. That's when it's time to look at all of your thoughts around the circumstance of, of your spouse dying. Literally, look at all the thoughts and think about, are they all true? What do you want to keep? What thought might you change? Because by doing that, you can begin to pick and choose how you want to feel, the results that you want to create in your life now. And we do all reach that point. Now, do we all reach that point at the same time? Oh, no, we don't. We don't. Um, you know, we can put basic guidelines out there, like that first initial state of shock begins to lift it around six months think many of us find that. And around six months is very general. Uh, on the death of our spouse, we immediately go into a state of shock. It's maybe some of us deeper than others. Maybe some of us notice it more than others. I've talked to so many widows who have said, you know, I didn't even cry at the funeral. I wondered what was wrong with me. And I remember feeling that way the night that Jim died. I was phoning family to let them know what had happened. 
and family was crying. Okay. Um, and what's amazing is uh, the more the more immediate the family, those closest to Jim did not immediately cry. Those members of family who were maybe one step removed sobbed immediately. I didn't cry at all. Here I was having to break this news myself because I didn't have anyone else to turn to here. So I'm having to do all these phone calls to say, Jim quite suddenly died tonight. And I was in the position of having to console these other people who were crying. And I was not crying. And I even had thoughts like, what is the matter with me? I mean, I thought I really loved him, but I'm not even crying. What's going on? I didn't realize at that point I was quite literally in a physical state of shock. That's why I wasn't crying. My brain had just shut down my emotions to protect me. Happens to all of us. We get that shut down. It's not there's something wrong with us. It's everything is right with us. Our brain is doing its job to protect us from that extreme, excruciating emotional pain. And it shuts us down. And then slowly over time, it begins to let a little more re awareness of the world around us sinking, sink in. And we experience little bits of that horrible loss over and over and over again, which makes it feel like, oh my God, this is just going to go on forever that I'm going to feel like this. The truth is, instead of feeling it all at once, you are feeling it over a long extended period of time. If you felt it all at once, it would probably be more than anyone could bear. That's why our brain protects us from that. So about six months in, I know I did, and many of the widows I talked to, we began to kind of lift our head up and see the world around us and begin to think about Okay, so what's next for me here? And that is a point in time where we can also start to think about all the things that we've been making it mean that our spouse died. All the story we've been telling ourselves about the spouse passing away. You know, I had a friend that wrote to me and said, when I lay in bed, the most noise I hear are the thoughts in my head. And these thoughts make me angry, sad, anxious, all those emotions I can't control. I am literally laying there alone in the quiet of my room and my thoughts overwhelm me. My emotions overwhelm me. That's when it's time to pick up a piece of paper and start writing down every thought that is racing around in your head. Mostly because if you get it all out on paper, you can set that to one side, go to sleep, right? It helps quiet it down once you've put it all out on paper. And if there are thoughts on that paper that you don't want laying around, crumple it up and throw it away. But even better, if you can look back at that at some point and pick out the thoughts that are really causing you a lot of emotional pain, and ask yourself if the thoughts are true, if those thoughts are valid. Byron Katie had us a process for this. She introduced four questions. If you've never read Byron Katie, I think she's fascinating. The questions that she says you should ask for any thought you're thinking when you write down that sentence that plays in your head, you ask yourself, is this thought true? Is it a true thought? The second question, after you've answered that first question, is, can you absolutely know that it's true? Sounds redundant, right? But it's not. Because so often you'll find at first you think, yeah, my thought's true. And then when you go, can I absolutely know this is true? You go, well... No, I guess I can't. And then the third question is, how do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? 
and you truly want to write down on paper about this. Yeah, it's all about one thought, one sentence in your head. But look at that sentence. Hold it out in front of you and think about how you react when you believe that. And the fourth question is, who would you be without that thought? If that thought were magically removed from your brain and you could never think it again, who would you be? What would your life be? This is a powerful exercise in just four questions. It's going to show you so much about yourself. So that's the power also of using that thought model. All right. This thought model has been talked about through the ages, for sure. So many scholars that I have read, ancient scholars, talk about, they don't say CTFAR, but they talk about your thoughts creating your emotions, creating your actions, creating the results in your life. You will read this over and over again. If you read Great Minds, if you read Tony Robbins, if you read um, Dispenza, it, all of these great minds talk about this flow of thought. Um, my mentor, Brooke Castillo, is the one that wrote it down as CTFAR to teach it, and it becomes an incredible tool. It's the key to any problem you're dealing with in your life because you can take anything going on in your life and you can fit it into that thought model and you can see exactly what's happening. Once you're able to separate out your thought from the fact and reality, now that can be difficult and that's where a life coach comes in, okay? Because a life coach can give you that outside perspective to help you develop your skill to more clearly see your thoughts and exactly how they're acting in your life. Remember, I'm not saying that any thought or emotion is good or bad for you. It's all your choice about how you want to feel and how you want to act. Again, it's our humanity that sometimes we're going to choose to think a negative thought and feel a negative emotion. Just because they're negative doesn't mean they're wrong. So if you write down CTFAR, maybe you have a thought about being laid off from work. You've been laid off or you've just been fired. Such an upsetting experience if you've ever gone through that. It's just a punch in the gut, right? But there are so many different thoughts you could be thinking about it. Once you move away from the situation and you, you come home, you've just been laid off, you've been let go, you're super upset. Maybe you do a thought download. You pull out a pad of paper and you start writing down all the thoughts in your head about it. And then you start to think about the other options that you could be thinking. You could think, you know what? I hated this job anyway. And this just saved me from having to try to make the decision to pull myself away from it. You could think this is just the push I needed to get out there and do something different, finally. Or you could think this is devastating. How am I going to pay my bills? Right? How different do those two thoughts think? Well, I hated this job anyway. This is just the push I needed to get out there and try something different. Think about how that would feel to think as opposed to, oh my God, how am I going to pay my bills and how embarrassing to have to tell other people that I've lost my job. Those feel awful. You could think my boss hates me and doesn't recognize my value and now you're feeling worthless. The thought you let play in your brain is going to dictate how you feel about it. You could feel inspired by it even, or you could just feel devastated. But the fact doesn't change. The sea line, the circumstance doesn't change in either one of those cases. The circumstance is laid off from work, period. That's the fact. All the rest of it depends on what you tell yourself about being laid off. So, 
When people begin to understand this, their very first reaction is, oh my God, I have to change all my thoughts because I don't want to feel bad. Now, <laughs> I recently put a post up on Facebook. Let me find this and tell you a little bit more about it. If you follow me on Facebook um, at Joanne the Life Coach, or if you are connected to my personal profile on Facebook, then you saw this post. The post had a picture of the Rainbow Bright Pony. I don't know which one, but Rainbow Bright was my daughter's generation. But I took that picture, and at the top it says, Quick, think a positive thought and have a nice day. And underneath it says, Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Because the truth is, and we see this all the time, I put it up kind of as satire on Facebook. Because on Facebook, you see all these little positive thinking memes all the time, all these little inspirational sayings, all these positive sayings, which is all nice. But after a while, I'm like, oh my gosh, all this positive thinking BS. Now, before you think that I've fallen to the dark side, hang with me. It's like, yeah, I have gotten to the place where I was frustrated with all the Pollyanna postings and look at the bright side memes. Why would somebody consider that all a lot of hoo-ha? Right? It's because when you try to take a really dark thought and replace it with My Little Ponies and Rainbow Brights, your brain immediately knows it's a lie. Your beautiful, efficient brain. You're not going to put a boatload of lies in there and get away with it. All right. Truly, your thoughts do create the reality of your life. But it's also critical to learn about your own thinking and your own neural pathways and the choices you want to make. And if you are thinking a very dark, upsetting thought, like, I've, the fact is you've been laid off from work and your thought is, this is devastating. I'm embarrassed to have to go home and tell anybody. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I'm in absolute panic. And you go, oh, those are negative thoughts. I think I'll just decide this is a good thing. Great. This is the best thing that ever happened to me. There is no way you, in that moment, you can believe that it's the best thing that ever happened to you. You can try to tell yourself that, but I mean, come on, you were just laid off. You can't throw a, this bright, positive, little glittery thought on top of something that you're feeling devastated about in the moment. You can look at all the devastating sentences that are playing in your head and you can begin to ask yourself, do I know this is true? Do you have the thought, um, all my bills are going to be late now. I'm not going to be able to pay them. And you look at that and you go, is this true? Do I absolutely know this is true? And you realize, no, I don't know this is true. I may have enough in my savings. I can cover this for a little while. Right? Maybe you have somebody that you know will be helping you with your bills a little bit until you can get your feet back under you. And you realize that that blatant thought of all my bills are going to go unpaid is maybe not true. Now, and you're going to begin to feel a little better. That's not the rainbow ponies, glittery, positive thought slapped on top of it. It's a real thought. It's a real thought that you can believe. That's the difference. It has to be a thought that you can actually believe. But the first step is to look at what you are thinking. Ask yourself those questions about it. Do I absolutely know this thought is true? And what would my life be like without that thought? Then you begin to say, wow, my life would be pretty amazing if I didn't think that. It's like going up the rungs of a ladder. You're not going to hit that happy, happy top rung all at once, but you can begin to 
start to rewrite some of your thoughts that take you to a better place and create better results in your life. The R line is everything, right? It's all about the results we want to have in our life. If you've been laid off from work and you're having devastating thoughts, you're going to have some pretty devastating results in your life. If you can begin to think thoughts that are a little less devastating, like, okay, it's not true that I'm not able to pay my bills. I'm going to be able to cover my bills at least for another 45 days. So I have 45 days to get out there and see what it is I want to do now. Feels a little better. And the action you take is to start looking at your options, which is going to create a much better result in your life. So this is the basis for being able to choose how you want to feel. This is how you get away from emotional pain to something that's a little more tolerate, tolerable for you. You become aware of the thoughts in your head. You become aware of the story you've been telling yourself. And you start to fill out CTFAR. You go right through it. Let me see where this thought takes me, how it makes me feel, and how do I act when I feel that way. Then you go, oh my gosh, yeah, and look at the re look how that results in my life. Okay, it becomes all very clear for you. So it's not going to help to try and thought swap immediately to a ponies and rainbow thought. And it's just because you're having a negative thought doesn't mean you should try to fix that thought. Maybe it's a th thought that you want to choose to have in your life. Maybe it's something that you say, hey, right now I want to feel bad about that. It's part of my humanity. It's part of my humanness to feel bad about that. That's why I tell people that you don't have positive feelings 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. That's just not part of being human. Part of the human experience is sometimes we feel badly. And it's okay. We choose to feel badly. And here comes the kicker. You can allow bad feelings. So many times, if we start to feel bad, we want to distract ourselves from it immediately so we don't have to feel that emotion. We try to change things up immediately. We go eat something, we go have a drink, maybe we go shopping, maybe we gamble because there's something that we don't want to think about and experience the bad feeling. When the truth is, you can allow the bad feeling. It is not going to kill you. And it's not going to last forever. We'll get into that more in a later podcast on how to process those feelings. Right now, I just want you to begin to understand some of the thoughts, to begin observing some of the thoughts you're having. It becomes a skill to be able to see your own thoughts. You become an observer of your own life so you can start to see the thoughts that you actually think. And you would be amazed when you start writing thoughts down on paper. Look at the sentences your brain is programmed to tell you. So many of the sentences, when you write them down, you're going to recognize them as programming from your youth when your brain was wide open. How many programs do you have in your brain from your youth? And I think for many of us, on this widow journey, the way we react to becoming widowed can be colored by how we think we are expected to act, how we expect to feel about it based on programming from somewhere in our previous years. So you can even analyze that. See if you have some programming going on there that maybe you don't like. You're like, wait a minute. No, this, it doesn't have to mean this. It doesn't have to mean the Hollywood version of being widowed. I get to walk my own journey 
with this. That's empowering. So listen, if you have begun to reach a place in your journey that you are looking at the world around you now and thinking, I really want to make this all mean something for me. I feel like I am called to move forward in a more positive way in the world and to create something in the world, then I want to talk to you because I am looking for widows who are ready to make a difference out there. In my widow coach certification class, I teach these concepts in a very deep way. We take it to the next level. And you become very proficient with these tools that I teach over 12 weeks. And you become a certified widow coach and you can begin to make a difference in the world. You become a part of this movement that I'm creating to get something out there in the world for widows. And by something, I don't mean grief groups. I don't mean hospice groups. I mean something just for widows. How cool would it be if you knew there was an entire network of widow coaches? And when you were first widowed, you could have reached out and worked with a coach whose experience of widowhood was similar to your own. To help you be able to have the strength to get through it and then find what it is you want to do to make your life mean something going forward. So look, reach out to me if you want to know more about the widow certification class. If you feel called to do this kind of work, send me an email. I would love to talk to you. You can also go to widowcoaches.com. If you go to widowcoaches.com, you can begin the process to find out more about the class. And I would love to see you all in class. We're starting the next class in January. So start planning for it now. We're already signing up people for the January class. I'm excited about that one. Like, let's get through the holidays and then take on 2018 like gangbusters. I think that, I think so, definitely. Thank you for listening to Widowcast. I can't wait to talk to you again next week. I'm launching my new book, The Widow Coach, next week. So if you're on Facebook, go find Joanne the Life Coach on Facebook and like that page and then keep an eye on that page next week because I will be doing lots of updates on that page about the book launch and how you can get a copy of The Widow Coach. Talk to you all later. Bye. Bye.